Good, so it's 9.50. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are ready with the next part of the today's uh, conference. The next session is a panel discussion entitled Realizing Pan-European Payment Solutions. I'm delighted to welcome the panel and the moderator, Fiona Van Esselpol, Deputy Director General at the ECB. Fiona, I give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aline, and good morning, everybody. It's a, a beautiful sunny morning here in Frankfurt. I, I hope the same is true for the, the rest of the audience who are joining us here today. Um, it's a very interesting moment in time to be sitting here discussing retail payments. There's a, a lot going on in this space, uh, now perhaps more than ever. Um, we see instant payments becoming widely available to all citizens and businesses across Europe. Uh, we see more and more the tech companies are rolling out their different types of payment solutions. We have the Apple Pays, Google Pays of this world and more. Um, also, third party providers are using the PSD2's access to payment accounts and payment processors are becoming centerpiece in the mergers and acquisitions business. Uh, also, the banking industry is having to adjust in a more structural way to the developments that are taking place. Um, in addition, we have the much talked about initiative uh, Libra uh, and uh, the stablecoin arrangement that comes with it. And last but not least, central banks themselves are also studying the merits of a central bank digital currency. And it's not just uh, the, the technical solutions uh, that we're seeing more and more and uh, more evolution there, but also payment behavior is changing. There's a shift to cashless payments at the physical point of sale and a shift to online shopping and therefore to online payments. And both these trends have been amplified due to the current uh, COVID pandemic. And this new behavior, of course, comes with new challenges and perhaps not all consumers can keep pace with these developments. And this is something we have to be very mindful of as well. Um, in a period of change and uncertainty, it's difficult often to take long term decisions, for example, investment decisions, also for providers of payment services. Nevertheless, it's of strategic importance to maintain or reclaim ownership of European payments as ownership is the best guarantee of being able to adjust our payments to meet the requirements of European stakeholders. So in today's panel, we will discuss how we can achieve one or maybe even more European payment solutions at the point of interaction. And I'm very pleased to be joined in this panel, first by Monique Goyens, Director General of the European Consumer Organization. Good morning, Monique. Uh, Gilles Grappinet, President of the European Digital Payments Industry Alliance, and CEO of Worldline. Um, Dimitri Patin, a colleague of mine here in the ECB's Market Infrastructure and Payments Department and also a Deputy Director General in this DG. Javier Santa Maria, Chairman of the European Payments Council, the EPC. And last but by no means least, uh, Joachim Schmalz, Executive Board Member of the German Savings Bank and Giro Association and part of the European Payments Initiative, EPI, that we will probably be hearing more about during the discussion. So um, let me start. I think we are running some questions on screen uh, as well, uh, and we will take up the, the answers that we find there in parallel. Um, so we will start maybe first with a, a question to you, Javier. Uh, why has it proven so difficult to roll out pan-European payment solutions or brands at the point of interaction? Okay, um, good morning, uh, Fiona. Thank you very much for inviting the European Payments Council to this event, which is not only interesting, but I would say also truly timely. So uh, to talk about pan-European solutions, of course, there are pan-European solutions for several cases and purposes, but uh, I guess that you refer to a fully-fledged, all-purpose, European-grown, uh, pan-European solution even uh, for use at POI. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, sorry, there is not yet a, a such a solution, which shouldn't uh, come as a surprise because Rome was not built in one day. If it is built uh, in one day, then it is not Rome. So uh, I think we have to assume that uh, as well, when there is a great claim, you need great evidence, when there is a great fit to be achieved, probably you will need to overcome uh, great uh, difficulties. Mm -hmm. So let us focus on, on the, for a minute, on the details. We are talking about innovation. We are talking about payments. On the one hand, payments are bound to proximity, therefore against the uh, aspect 
of this pan-European angle. They are subsidiary to uh, underlying economic transactions and therefore tend to adapt to specialized uh, use cases against the all-purpose uh, aspect as well. And they thrive on simplicity. So also against the complexity that comes with uh, all-purpose uh, solutions. So it is, it is not obvious that a, such a pan-European solution should be uh, easy to achieve. On the other hand, we are talking about innovation. Innovation yeah. usually takes small steps, not huge ones. Uh, Mr. Panetta referred to radical innovation. Usually radical innovation is the result of the accumulation of smaller progressive uh, innovations. <coughs> so uh, it focuses on niches, on specific uh, use cases, concrete situations with no good solution at hand. So that is why uh, before a fully uh, fledged uh, solution is rolled out, we need to have in place um, what I would say more elementary uh, building blocks as previous stages. And there is what, where we stand uh, now. We have uh, developed pan-European payments uh, coming uh, from national ones. We have developed real-time payments coming from a batch processing world. We are developing a request to pay a scheme coming from a one-way private uh, payments uh, world. With these world building blocks as primary uh, outcome of innovation, we can now think of a fully-fledged, uh, all-purpose, pan-European, European-grown uh, solution. So I think this was needed before we can uh, think about that. And furthermore, and here I will uh, end, the appearance of such a solution should not be expected to happen easily given that payments worked in the old uh, world pretty well, but it was not the most uh, uh, needed uh, uh, innovation to, to, to be uh, deployed. Uh, it is the future demand uh, we think of that stemming from a mature single market, uh, what we think about uh, uh, a payment solution to match that future uh, demand. So we are anticipating the future. I sympathize with what uh, Mrs. McInnes was saying, that uh, it is not that we can rest quiet and, and calm. We need to anticipate the future. And for that, well, yes, it is true. It is not easy. It is demanding. It is tough. But I think that is what uh, we should do. Work hard to overcome difficulties to get to that uh, mature single market. Thank you very much, Javier. Uh, Gilles, if I could ask you the same question from your vantage point, uh, what, what would you see as the, the reasons why we haven't managed to achieve such a solution so far? And uh, but maybe you also see we have the building blocks there at the moment as well. Yeah, for sure. Good morning, Fiona, and many thanks to the ECB for this invitation and good morning to all. I'm really very glad. Indeed, as Javier said, this is a very timely event on a very, very important topic for us all. And so maybe I would start, Fiona, by saying that let's not be too tough with ourselves. Here I'm talking from an industry standpoint, an industry player standpoint. Europe has been quite innovative when it came, as a matter of fact, to create pan-European payment means uh, and to be innovative. If I compare with the rest of the world, I believe that we stand uh, ahead of, in many domains, uh, of course, historically in card payment with the very early adoption of EMV, chip and PIN, which mm -hmm. is still something that you don't find in all continents by far, including, as we know, the US, uh, with open banking, uh, instant payment, and uh, SIPA in general for account payments. I mean, we've been creating pan-European payment solutions. The point is that, indeed, we did not succeed in creating a powerful pan-European retail payment brand something that is actually making a difference at the point of sale and we rely still today as we know for our intra-european payment on foreign brands which is of course coming with a cost and a dependency so your question was why i would say th there are two dimensions why and have these reasons changed today to be successful, as Javier was mentioning, it is demanding. Why? I believe there are multiple answers, and I don't want to be too long here. But the fragmentation of our European payment ecosystem with uh, thousands of banks, no pan European acquirers, uh, 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 underdeveloped for decades international retail that was not ex expressing a very strong need, and to a certain extent, the lack of perception of a real need in front of a challenging business case at the time may have explained why in the end we tried money a SIPA for card and we did not try very hard at the time there was also probably a different perception of the geostrategic context 
we thought maybe that friends were friends forever and that the balance of the world was what it was during the Cold War. I believe many of these reasons have changed as a matter of fact. The consolidation of the payment market, at least the industry players, create now scalable players that can support like we can do ourselves, pan-European initiative in a much more efficient manner and deploy much faster, things that would have taken years. Uh, probably also the perception of the market need is very different. There are powerful e-commerce players that need a simple solution to operate on a cross-border basis. Merchants have grown an international franchise with thousands of shops across Europe. They would take advantage of powerful pan-European retail payment brand for sure. And I believe that our perception of the geostrategic context has changed too over the recent past. And there was an ambiguous situation with Visa Europe. Uh, we were not exactly knowing if it was more Visa or more Europe. Now we know it has been sold. Things are clear today. And I believe that there also our perception that relying exclusively on non-European payment brands to make our own currency circulating at point of sales and on websites is certainly probably today something we don't feel really comfortable with due to the evolution of the geostrategic context. For me, all these reasons explain why we are probably much more ready today than before to tackle very seriously uh, the topic of today for this conference. Okay. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jill, and uh, very good to hear that we uh, we are in a better place now than uh, pre maybe some years ago to, to tackle the challenges that lie ahead. Um, in the meantime, uh, Aline, I think we've had the results of the poll. I don't know whether you can show these on screen. Yep. So okay. the results are showing on I just the right-hand side. So on the we don't have a lot of people voting, so everyone out there, get ready mm. for the next question. But on the first question, the need for a pan-European payment solution, we have a yes. Okay. So that's good. And on the second question, is the, um, can we show the second question, please? So on the second question, we have the majority saying, so that's the when will it happen? So people are saying in two years or in after five or later. Mm -hmm. So we have these two winning. Okay. Thank you for that. And maybe I would ask our panelists what they they think uh, of the, the responses there. Monique, maybe I start with you, especially coming from the consumer side. Are you surprised? Um, not really, because maybe the word pan-European payment solution is a little bit a, a bubble uh, concept mm -hmm. that is not necessarily talking, uh, speaking to the public in general. But first of all, let me say very, very happy to be part of this of this conversation and and and, and uh, representing the consumer perspective. I would also like to give a little bit of a, an optimistic perspective because uh, the title is uh, realizing a pan-European solution for payments. But we already have two pan-European solutions, which are credit transfers and direct debit. Uh, of course, you cannot pay with that um, in shops, uh, except in Germany. Um, there, you need cards and cash. And uh, of course, we know that banks are, for the moment, really trying to discourage the, the use of cash. And I'm very happy to have heard Mrs. McGuinness say that the maintenance of cash is key uh, for social mm -hmm. inclusion. And when it comes to cards, except if uh, those cards are national for the moment, and except if you are part of a, an American scheme, as has been just said by, by Gilles, uh, you can you can you you cannot really make cross border payments. And what I would like to say there is that we know that ECB has been really trying very hard over the last years to get a pan European uh, card scheme uh, available, uh, uh, and we are very happy that now this is going this is moving. And what I would like to say, because I heard um, about, uh, the colleagues say that it's difficult. But I would like to say this is not a 21st century revolution. I mean, I'm old enough to have had a European credit card in the 1980s. It was called Eurocard. It had it existed, and it was sold to Mastercard. I mean, so that was a that was a, a private decision by the banking system to get to, to get, get away from that. And that's something. And of course, we need to go towards pan-European payment solutions with a lot of uh, let's say different solutions available. And in the in the pipeline, we are very happy about this competitive um, development for consumers. Okay, thank you very much, Monique. Uh, maybe Joachim, if I could ask you, are, are you surprised uh, or you think uh, the results of the poll are as you would have expected? Maybe we skip Joachim for now. Uh, we're having some problems uh, connecting him. Okay, very good. Then I move on to Dimitri. What would you think? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, today, uh, Fiona. 
Uh, well, I think I think this um, the, the the results that we have seen uh, reflect a, an increasing alignment of the planets in terms of a desire for pan-European solutions to materialize. I mean, I, when I saw the, the the questions, I did myself my 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 own predictions, and I had put eighty percent yes. So I, I see I don't have the figures now, but I see that it's even more. It's kind of ninety percent yes. Uh, and my bet was a critical mass around two years. Now I see that it's more split between two years and probably five years or more. And it's, I believe, just highlighting the complexity of, of the undertaking. And um, now the question is, is this achievable? And I'm now thinking of my predictions over uh, two years. Well, hopefully, hopefully yes, but it's, um, it, it, it's quite a challenge, basically. Uh, maybe the reassuring part uh, uh, is that we see uh, many parts of the puzzle moving and, and actually moving in the right direction. Um, we have the SCT in scheme. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe the adoption is not as, as it should be, but but it's there. Uh, we will soon, I think Javier was mentioning the, the request to pay, the scheme for request to pay, which is coming. We have, I, I heard uh, Fabio Panetta say earlier, uh, referring earlier to the, the reachability measures adopted by the, the ECB governing council uh, quite uh, during summer. And I will come back to that later. Um, and also, I would say, uh, growing prospects of having at least one pan-European uh, solution at the point of interaction becoming a reality in the near future. So I, I, would, I would want to make a short analogy with cycling. And, and as everyone knows, cycling is an individual sport conducted with teams. No? And uh, the, 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 the point here is that you can be as strong as you like the best chances to, to, to perform decently is while you are part of the team. And, and maybe this is what we were missing a bit in Europe. So there, there was probably not enough a sensing of, of belonging to a team. And, um, and I believe this is what we try to do here today in the conference, but, the, uh, but, but more generally for the moment in Europe, is to kind of build this uh, Europe uh, for retail payments team, basically, and to make it a winning team. So. The point is that in a winning team, there is no hiding. So uh, everyone that belongs to the team must contribute. And uh, what I can do here, and I, I'm just uh, maybe even reusing some words that I heard from Fabio Panetta earlier. I mean, I can only reiterate that from the ECB perspective and from the Eurosystem perspective in general, we, we, we are committed to, to contribute with what we can bring basically. And, um, one of the action is to be quite forceful, forceful in terms of uh, acting as a catalyst. And I think we are quite active in that respect. So, well, the, the, the figures, are, I, 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 I don't believe they are surprising. The, the, the figures are what, what, uh, uh, what everyone would expect at this stage. But I will conclude with that. Between, between answering to a question and having this materializing, there is still a distance and, and we need to pitch the gap. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, and a very nice idea of this being a, a team sport. I, I think this is a, a very uh, good analog analogy here. Um, we're, we still don't have uh, Joachim Schmalz, I think, uh, Aline. Is that correct? No, Joachim Schmalz is still uh, connect. We're trying to connect him in a different way. Okay. It's problem solved soon. Okay. But perfect. Okay. But then maybe we continue. And uh, maybe I would continue then with a, a question to you, Javier. Uh, the European Payments Council, the EPC, has developed the European scheme for instant payments that we all know very well, SCT INST. How do you see its current uh, uptake and what is on the horizon for the coming years? Uh, I think you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. I yeah. thought I had done it. Uh, well, uh, looking into the glass, I would say that I'm more uh, or closer to seeing it as half uh, full rather than half empty. So. I'm, I'm optimistic and, and positive. Mm -hmm. uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have the figures for the third quarter of this year, so uh, I must refer to the second quarter. Then 6.5% of all credit transfers were instant credit transfers. So uh, to me, that means that we are beyond the critical mass. If we understand critical mass as that which um, signals the point in which a process is self-sustainable. So there is no way back. To me, we are there. So it's no way back. The SET Inst will stay there uh, in the future. This uh, traffic comes from uh, more than 2,200 uh, PSPs in Europe, meaning 
56% of all PSPs in Europe and two thirds of uh, PSPs in the Euro area. So it is, it is still growing. It, it does not grow continuously. It goes step by step, it's step uh, function. But uh, I am optimistic, I am positive. It is present in 22 countries. So uh, a majority of countries in the uh, SEPA area. If we uh, talk about performance, 99% of all transactions are uh, finalized in less than five seconds. And I would say uh, well below that threshold of five seconds. We, if we uh, remember the, the original idea, it was 10 seconds or the, the first uh, um, idea was to, to, to secure uh, transactions were uh, processed in less than 10 seconds. We are well below five seconds. That is, uh, that is good. We have uh, um, raised uh, the, um, the amount, uh, the limit amount, or the, the amount limit to uh, 100,000 uh, euros in July without any uh, disruption or any significant incident. Uh, and this was done during the tough times of the, of the uh, crisis. And uh, if we look also into the, the time span, around one third of transactions take place outside the daytime. So uh, really adjusting to the needs of the, of the users. Uh, because it's not only the real time factor, it's also the 24 hours, seven days a week uh, feature that we have to bear in mind. So to me, this, these figures mean that we have built a solid uh, foundations to what is uh, to come in the future. We are working hard on preparing uh, the launch of this uh, scheme, the request to pay, which I think will also complement the asset inst. Also, it is not exclusively intended to uh, instant payments, but probably it will uh, make use of instant, pay payments, instant payments heavily. And uh, we hope to launch the scheme uh, uh, next month in November uh, so that the market is ready to make it effective uh, along uh, 2021. I think this is for the time being uh, what we can uh, say of what the EPC is uh, working on really and really I think I'm positive in this. Mm -hmm. uh, today we are working on hard on making that possible that uh, by uh, November we will be able to uh, release the first version of the RTP, bearing in mind that we are also preparing a second version for the next year, November uh, 2021. Okay, thank you very much for that, Javier. So it's it's very promising uh, what you say. Uh, the take up of instant payments is definitely increasing quite a bit, and uh, we are very close then to the the go live for uh, the first of uh, request to pay. Good. Yep. Okay. Monique, maybe moving to the consumer side and uh, consumers are very much in the minds of everybody. We heard from Mairead McGuinness too that uh, the consumer was foremost in the minds of the commission when they were coming up with their retail payment strategy. Um, so for yourself, the European Consumer Organization, this has been a staunch defender of consumer rights and consumer choice. How will instant payments be ben beneficial to consumers? Well, indeed, freedom of choice is one of our uh, fundamental values. Uh, as long as the choice is not manipulated and in the context mm. of digitalization of finance, a choice can be manipulated and we all need to be very, very uh, concerned about that and have a monitor what's happening there. But of course, for us, the introduction of instant payment uh, solutions is uh, a competitive element of a market that has been highly dominated by uh, not enough uh, payment solutions. So we welcome that very much. Maybe just a few points that I would like to make there. Uh, first of all, uh, you really should consider instant payments to become the new normal, uh, meaning it's not a premium service and meaning that um, the banks should resist uh, the temptation uh, to uh, charge fees that are not in proportion with, uh, with the service that is, is going to become uh, the normal service. Uh, we, uh, we know that uh, there is a lot of work going on uh, in the context of the ERPB on this uh, instant payments at the point of interaction, where it will be soon possible to, um, to pay um, by instant payments in shops via, for example, a, a QR code. And for us, this is really a, a very, very interesting development. What we are a little bit concerned about is the fact that uh, the, there will be, a, if we understand correctly, a single scheme for cards and for instant payments that would be uh, managed by the banks. So we believe that that might be a risk of killing competition because if it is the banks or a, a certain amount of number of banks that have the monopoly of managing two schemes, 
that might be something that might hinder competition and might really uh, need to be monitored. And the last point I would like to make, uh, instant payment is one element of competition. There could be another way forward, which is uh, direct debit, de direct debit, like it has is being done for the moment in Germany already, where um, retailers and customers have the choice uh, at, the, at the point of sale in the shop uh, to, to do, have an electronic uh, direct debit uh, instead of a card payment. Uh, and what we see is that uh, Germany, and this is also confirmed in the Commission report on interchange fees, in Germany, uh, there is the lowest rate of merchant service fee. So it can be linked to the fact that there is a competition between the cards and the instant payment uh, and the direct debit solution, meaning that, um, well, it's a, it's a very good demonstration that competition gets prices down, at least for the merchants. Not sure whether it trickles down to the customer at the end of the day, but still it's a, it's a very good element of uh, competition. Okay, thank you for that, Monique. And uh, pleased to see that in the meantime, uh, Joachim Schmalz has uh, joined us. Joachim, you're very welcome. Uh, I don't know whether you want to add something uh, at this point yourself, because you, I don't know whether you had the chance to hear the results of the poll surveys. Well, unfortunately, not uh, not that well. Sorry for that. No uh, problem. I have, um, but, but to give, to give uh, some view about this, uh, uh, Thinking about the what is necessary about the, the uh, competition. Let's see. Um, I think we have we have uh, already a, a monopoly sort of situation coming from the ICS. In, mm -hmm. Sorry, I have this bad link. I'm still not happy about this. Uh, we have we have a oligopoly situation because the ICS is the only one that have a European scheme there because the, the national banks mm -hmm. don't have a European scheme. So the only way to have a poor European scheme owned by Europeans would be that the banks uh, can increase their, their possibilities to have a technology solution for them. And if we, I think we have a strong position on instant payment, but if we don't can earn money on instant payment, uh, and we have a business model also of instant payment, there's no no more need for investment and no money for investment. And on the other side, the ICSs, who has this oligopoly situation for pan-European payment system they have, uh, get all the money, can increase the fees for merchants, can invest more for uh, for innovation products, also for marketing, also for spending, also for buying other national card schemes. And uh, so we, you have the choice whether you want to have banks building a payment systems, then you have to give them room for investments, you have to give them room for, for earnings, or you will stay for the international card schemes as the only one, as an oligopoly. And then we all know what happens if an oligopoly gets uh, mightier and mightier. Okay, thank you for sharing these thoughts with us, uh, Joachim. And uh, indeed, uh, the, you raise some uh, important points in this respect. Aline, can I just check, do we have questions at this stage from the audience? Um, no, not no. yet. We will talk okay. to you as soon as they come. Thank you. All right, very good. But then maybe I, I move on to Dimitri. Um, the ECB itself, of course, um, has also its own offering for instant payments and has as well taken measures to support full pan-European reach for banks and for clearinghouses. How do you see the developments and can the ECB do more to facilitate pan-European reach of instant payments? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Fiona. Uh, indeed, you are now uh, obviously referring to the, the two measures, measure mm. one and measure two, that are now famous. I believe that the, the, the Government Council took during summer. Um, what do those two measures are called reachability measures. Mm. So, um, the, 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 the point is that the, the governing council had to step in uh, uh, because uh, despite all efforts, and, and I, I don't want to draw a, a too negative uh, um, point, uh, uh, you know, landscape, but, but still, uh, despite all the efforts made to, to promote instant payments, the, the prospects of achieving full reachability uh, across Europe were not there. And the, the root cause for that is, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, a multiplicity of uh, auto automated clearing houses, uh, often anchored locally, um, and combined with a situation where there is no uh, convenient interoperability between those ACHs. And this is actually 
from the reachability perspective, preventing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the pan-European reach to materialize. And, and of course, to solve these issues, the, the, the Euro system uh, has been investigating, okay, what can we do? And, and you made reference to the, the TIPS infrastructure, and, and we, we've been assessing what were options to support uh, better the pan-European reachability. And we have come with those two measures. So what are they? Uh, the first measure, M1, is actually that all PSPs that have adhered to the SCT in scheme and that are reachable in target two must also become reachable in TIPS, either as a participant in TIPS or just as a reachable party. That's the measure one. And the measure two is uh, uh, more on the side of the ACHs and uh, consists of you know, requesting that the ACHs that are offering instant payment solutions uh, 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 instant payment services uh, migrate their, tech, their uh, accounts from target to, to tips. And uh, what it makes, the combination of those two measures, uh, it makes that it creates a space where PSPs can decide, well, they can decide to be either participant in tips or just reachable party. They can decide to be a member of uh, one or several ACHs uh, as they wish, basically. But there will be no, uh, there will now be the guarantee that any payment that is involving another PSP somewhere in Europe, uh, potentially with two ACHs in the loop, will successfully be executed instantly and actually independently of the choices made by the other PSP. And uh, well, maybe to be more precise, I mean, I should not speak about the guarantee of, su of successfully being executed. But at least if it does not succeed, it will not be on the grounds of reachability uh, problems. So these measures were discussed uh, intensively uh, internally within the Euro system, but also I insist with market participants and ACHs. We had several workshops and discussions to come up with those proposals. So it's not kind of a autocratic decision mm -hmm. from the, the Governing Council. The point is that the Governing Council is the one capable of making that decision. So we, we believe indeed that this is quite a major contribution to towards making instant payments the new norm uh, uh, in Europe. Um, maybe other benefits, because we talk a lot about reachability, but another uh, two other benefits I would say is one, and I think uh, Javier mentioned that already, um, these measures will actually uh, make that the current limitations that we have coming from the opening hours of target two in terms of funding and defending will be removed, meaning that as soon as the, the funding is present in TIPS, it can be moved to any of the accounts that the PSP has with an ACH. Um, and the other element, the drawback of fragmented liquidity pots, as we call them, will also be to a large extent uh, mitigated. So it, it's, it's reachability, but also mm -hmm. Uh, probably in, in improvement in terms of uh, liquidity management. Uh, now, now moving on to the implementation, uh, when we, we said already during summer, the Government Council took uh, the decision to implement those two measures. And our purpose, our objective is actually to complete the rollout of that by the end of next year. So that's why I replied somewhere uh, two years in the in the first question. Mm. Um, the first measure, so the, the fact that PSPs should become reachable in tips, I mean, the PSPs can proceed as they like at the pace they want according to their implementation pattern. It can be done today. It can be done whenever they like. The tips is ready for that. Uh, and and the, the point is that the, the NCBs, the, the national central banks, will also be supporting and monitoring the adoption or the, 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 the readiness uh, of their uh, own communities. Um, from regarding the second measure, so the, the, the ACH is moving their accounts from uh, target two to tips. Uh, well, the software, so the tip software must be adapted and we have started already the, adap the adaptations. And uh, I must say we have al already started also a dialogue with industry to uh, provide the technical details on, for instance, on the new messaging flows. We have had workshops a few, a few weeks ago. And we also want to uh, initiate a debate or discussion on how to precisely organize the migration from target to, to tips, uh, especially for the ACHs. The team told me recently that we plan to have a workshop 
uh, somewhere mid of November. So again, we believe this is quite important uh, as a as a step uh, towards you know it's only one element, but it's an important one uh, for pan-European uh, uh, instant uh, payments. And le let me finish maybe with one one word on the work that we do uh, currently with the Swedish Central Bank. So. Uh, I, I suspect most of you know that the risk bank has decided to also use tips for its instance payments in in, uh, in, uh, in Sweden, and, and this as of May uh, 2022. Um, and, and actually, this is also an interesting development because it uh, allows us, well, together with the, the colleagues from from Sweden, to invest to investigate designs whereby post currency instant payment would become possible. At this stage, there is no commitments, but there are investigations going on. So, so to your question, Fiona, uh, can we do more? Maybe, maybe we can do more, but I think we do a lot already. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dimitri. And from your discussions, let's say with the market and in these workshops, there is a, a willingness to go forward. You feel it? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. You know, the, the way we presented was were we 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 had really an open dialogue, and in the workshop, I mean, mm. the, the participants all themselves came with some proposals and and that's how we we ended up finally with those two measures okay there was i believe uh, uh of course there is always uh, a certain degree of fear when things change that's normal mm -hmm. but there was i believe quite a broad consensus on the, the the relevance of those two measures yes okay very good to hear so while we're working on the central banking side with the solutions that uh, Dimitri just mentioned, and uh, maybe moving to yourself, Jill, uh, the European Digital Payments Industry Alliance, uh, this was recently created to join forces between acquirers and processors of digital payments. And yourself, of course, as president of uh, this association, how do you see your role in driving forward a, a pan-European payment solution or even solutions? Yeah, I just just say the uh, EdPR was created initially by Ingenico, Nets, mm. Nexi, and Worldline, and is now having more and more new joiners like SIA recently uh, from Italy. Mm. And uh, we represent the largest uh, payment services providers, both acquirers or indeed financial industrial processors for supporting banks in issuing and uh, uh, dealing with their payment needs. So we have designed this association with a very clear objective in mind, which is first to gather genuinely European companies. I, I just mean it one sec, which is only companies having their headquarters, mm -hmm. their real decision centers in Europe, their R&D centers, and most of their business interests are linked with the future of digital payments in Europe. And on purpose, we have excluded uh, from membership European subsidiaries of larger non-European groups to make sure we really voice the concern of genuine industry players of the European payment ecosystem. And why so? Because our broader objective is really to support the EU objective to create a digital single market fueled by digital payments. The purpose, and it is part of our uh, mandate, of EDPIA is to contribute to the EU policy debate that will define the future of the business environment for digital payments. And when I was hearing Fabio Panetta's and Commissioner McGuinness uh, sharing with us their agenda for the future of digital payment these days, this is somehow directly the working agenda of EDPIA in the coming years if we are of course uh, invited to participate and contribute to all these key initiatives and we made very clear that we are absolutely ready to participate into any relevant european governance bodies for uh, payment topics to contribute and bring our experts and give our honest views uh, in particular as large acquirers uh, on any success factors we would believe would impact the chance of success of such uh, initiative like pan-European payment solutions, and particularly participate into regulatory debates or any market-led uh, pan-European initiative like EPI, of course, uh, in particular regarding how we can contribute to make it successful. Uh, this is really uh, something we believe was needed after years of consolidation. We have created these large independent companies that are no longer, strictly speaking, belonging to the banks because uh, payment assets have been transferred to us. But we need to replace somehow the voice 
uh, of the banks in that context or complement the voice of the bank and of course the other payment stakeholders the, the consumers and the merchant organization to make sure we can really contribute to aligning interest and having a vivid debate to make sure we adopt soon and fast and efficiently the best payment options so this is really the mandate of FTR. Okay, thank you. And it's indeed, as you say, very much aligned uh, with the retail payment strategy of the Commission when it comes to European strategic autonomy and uh, also with that of the ECB and the Eurosystem with our retail payment strategy that Fabio referred to that was uh, announced in November last year. Um, Joachim, moving on to you, uh, the German savings banks, uh, they have uh, millions of customers, as we all know, and they, they, the savings banks play a, a major role in Ger German and European payments. In July 2020, you announced to be one of the 16 founding members of the new European Payments uh, Initiative, EPI. What are your expectations for EPI? And uh, as EPI, what do you plan to bring European users? Well, the, our expectation is uh, rather simple. We think retail payment uh, solutions in Europe have uh, no, not keep pace with the needs of the consumer and the merchants. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a patchwork of domestic uh, national solutions with uh, little or no cross-border acceptance. This has resulted in dependency on the national card schemes and uh, we have no real choice for consumers and merchants. So we have to consolidate. And uh, even in Germany, where the saving banks have a market share of 50%, it's not big enough to compete with uh, the volumes and the, and the efficiency of the, the bigger players in the world. So we have to consolidate in Europe all together and uh, the banks are very happily uh, enforcing and uh, looking together how they can find the right solution for each of the markets. Uh, the markets are different, it's complex. The consumer needs are different between French and German, between Belgium, Netherlands and Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to combine them and to find the right solution with cost efficiency on the side of the infrastructure, but also on a customer experience side for each of the individual wishes of the consumers uh, in the markets. And we're making progress. We just uh, uh, invented the, the, the company, the internal company was founded. We have, yesterday we had the first board meeting of the new company. We invited new banks. There are already someone knocking on the door to come to the round of 16. Uh, to get together. We have a small period until the end of this year for other participants uh, to come to our EPI infrastructure solution. And uh, we happily to see the, the first proof of concept next year. And we think that we get the full rollout of the project uh, until 24. Okay, very good. So uh, things are, are really happening now. Uh... Indeed, with uh, the, the setup of the new company, I think this is uh, very important and it, it's really becoming very concrete. Good to hear. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, another question, uh, perhaps uh, to yourself, Dimitri. What do you think? Uh, we hear a lot about the, the big tech firms. Uh, has Europe lost the competition to global big tech when it comes to digital payments? Or would you say that the right elements are in place now for a sex successful rollout of pan-European payment solutions at the point of interaction? Yeah, well, um, you know, using again an analogy, I, I believe the match is ongoing, so nothing is lost at this stage. We, we, we may have reached the half time with a score that is not necessarily the one we would want. Basically, we, we may be lagging a bit behind, but we still need to play the second half and then good teams can, can react. So, so uh, what we define, what we try to do now is defining the tactics for the, for the second half. Now, now, this being said, um, and I think Joachim was, was uh, hinting to that, we are still confronted with an excessive fragmentation across Europe and with many local schemes and solutions that, that, that actually do not have the potential of ever becoming pan-European. And, and we need to be mindful of that. Um, the, well, this element of fragmentation combined with an, a, a never faster digitalization of the society and also with the presence of big techs and, and, uh, and, and quite uh, agile uh, global actors um, is actually raising some policy concerns. I, I, I will not repeat what I heard from uh, Fabio Panetta uh, uh, earlier today. Uh, it, it, it's creating some policy concerns in terms of um, competitiveness and independence of the European retail payment system as a whole. 
but also in terms of security, in terms of operational resilience. And, and those characteristics are quite important when it comes to delivering uh, state-of-the-art payment services uh, tailor-made for, for Europe, basically. And, and uh, for this reason, the, the, the Euro system has updated its uh, retail payment strategy. And maybe contrary to what we did for the European reachability, where we really acted as operator or platform, uh, here we are acting more is a, in a role of catalyst and um, beyond the, the, the other objectives of uh, usability and sustainability of what we, what we implement, um, a, a key element in our strategy is, uh, is to foster, as you, you have understood already, the development of pan-European pan solutions that are meeting five criteria. And I, I will... I feel sorry for those who, who, who were there when, when Panetta was, uh, Fabio Panetta was, was speaking because it's the same, the very same criteria. So the first one is pan-European uh, reach and, and seem less experienced. And that means uh, the ability to make payments at the point of interactions, I would say under the same conditions and in a consistent manner across the EU. So that's the first criteria. The second criteria is convenience and low cost. Um, here we are touching about we are touching on criteria like ease of use, user friendliness, uh, ability to use to to initiate payments using different tools from the the, the payment cards from mobile phones. Um, the third criteria is safety and security. Obviously, we talk here about compliance with the the, the relevant legal uh, regulatory oversight frameworks and, and requirements. We talk about strong user authentication. We talk about user protection or consumer protection. And the, the fourth criteria um, is, is, uh, is uh, the, the, the point of, and I think it's a very important one uh, given the geopolitics now, it's the idea of a European brand and governance. I think we, we've been stressing that uh, many times already this morning. And then comes the last one, which is global acceptance, meaning beyond the EU for people traveling and so on. So that, that's why uh, in our role as Catalyst, we are uh, ready to support uh, any solution that would comply with those five criteria. I mean, we've heard Joachim uh, and, 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 uh, um, speaking about the European Payments Initiative, so the EPI. It's, it's correct to see that at this stage, this initiative looks quite promising. And we see, we, we just heard that there, are very, there is really a time schedule uh, already uh, uh, in place. Uh, but of course, we, we are ready to, to, uh, to uh, uh, hear if there are other uh, solutions that are uh, uh, also compliant with those five criteria, of course, we would, we would be uh, supportive. So, uh, and, and we believe that when, when we do this, when we have um, the ability to develop uh, pan-European solutions like EPI or, or, or any mm. other, uh, then we can compete uh, serious, seriously with global car schemes and big techs. So that, that's, uh, that's a bit of uh, uh, ac action, I would say, acting as a catalyst. And, and I, uh, maybe to conclude, uh, the future will be what we make out of it, basically. And uh, to answer the question, did we lose something? No, uh, the, the, the match is not uh, uh, over, but it's great time that we play the second half well. Okay, thank you very much, <laughs> Dimitri. Very clear. Um, I see that we have uh, quite a few questions coming in from the audience now, but maybe before we take those, Jill, I would ask you uh, from your perspective, would you see it the same as Dimitri when it comes to uh, the competition versus uh, big tech? Yes, uh, big tech and other, uh, other payment brands uh, uh, more, uh, more largely, huh? because of course my answer as a businessman and also uh, as representing uh, the association is definitely not at all. We cannot have lost the battle that we did not really deliver so far, because I only believe that Monet was a serious attempt to, to tackle this issue uh, 10 years back. But I think we must look at the reality without complacency. We let a void in our payment architecture with the absence of a powerful pan-European retail payment brand for circa 15 years since we launched the euro. And as we all know, nature hates void. So numerous power brands have been launched in between, other have been growing very fast. And as uh, it was said uh, previously by Joachim, some of these are supported by some of the wealthiest companies in the humankind history. So uh, it won't be a walk in the park. 
to come in this crowded place supported by people having muscles and brains and ultra powerful uh, B2C brands. Mm -hmm. So I would add to that that uh, if we decide really to move forward some significant pan-European payment solution as collective initiative, failure is hardly an option for us all because we cannot invest on everything in parallel. And if we invest massively on this new uh, pan-European payment solution, most probably, I believe, we will stop investing on the existing local domestic brand. Whatever we may think of their limits, they have been the only remaining barrier that we were having against absolute foreign dominance on our payment ecosystem. So if we don't succeed in the new initiative, while we would be weakening the domestic scheme, it will be a total loss on both fronts. It would be like cleaning the table for foreign brands. I believe it is a very serious stake, which drives me to, to thinking that whatever we do, whether it is EPI or tomorrow, other pan European uh, payment solution that would be initiated, uh, I see three major key success conditions if we want really to win the battle. The first one is having an inclusive governance from the start. Not only banks, but really all stakeholders strongly associated from the start to make sure that we build together a real business value proposition for the merchants, for the payers with innovative features and indeed a competitive cost for all. And of course, a positive business case, Joachim was mentioning it for the issuing banks. It is no different for the large acquirers, equipping millions of point of sales, zillions of internet payment pages, onboarding on payment apps of merchants, a new payment brand is anything but a low investment for acquirers the same way. So we need to make sure that we have a payback for all. And I believe we have the room to create something smart and that can at the same time be competitive and interesting for all stakeholders. And the last comment here, we've been mentioning, and I was hearing from Fabio Panetta's, the comment that such initiatives are also welcome from a sovereignty standpoint. Uh, this drives me to a comment that if I look at the big superpowers of the world, the US has their payment brands for Eon, like Visa, Master, Discover, uh, China has Union Pay, Japan has GCB, Russia has created Mir, India has created Rupay. Europe is the only superpower that has not equipped itself with its own retail payment brand to secure its independence. Somehow, this is also a public good. And the public good, I would not be shocked that it would be also sponsored by the public stakeholders, the states, the EU, to help uh, its economic uh, business model. Because we don't work only for private interest here, I understand. We would not work for private interest. It would also secure the European independence in the complex geostrategic uh, environment. So uh, for me, definitely, uh, I mean, Dimitri was saying it, uh, it has to be Team Europe if we want to initiate these things, because it is not a given, because it is demanding, it is a huge investment for all. And we need to gather really a team where there would be the issuing banks, of course, but acquirers, regulators, and private and public stakeholders. That would be, for me, the winning team. Okay, thank you. Very clear, Jill. Thank you very much for that. Um, Aline, I don't see the questions myself. Do you want to uh, read some of them out and we will see with our panelists who would like to take them? Yes. Uh, definitely. So we're having a lot coming in. So sorry for the ones we're not going to be able to answer. But there's one here that maybe fits with what Jill was just saying. So uh, also about money. So the question is, how can we ensure that instant payments at the point of sale are competitive with credit cards? With some credit cards, you have benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas for instant payments, do not foresee such mechanism. That's one of them. Do you want me to read out more? Or, do you or maybe we take that one first. I think, Monique, you were raising your hand. You were <laughs> looking like this is something that is already on your plate to look at, yes? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, and I saw the, the, the question before you, and I hope yeah. that you would ask uh, ah, yeah. me to answer. So um, I think, first of all, there is really a very fundamental um, point there, which is uh, there is not a, a regulatory level playing field uh, between credit cards and other means of payment. Indeed, there is for credit cards, uh, uh, you know, the chargeback, uh, and there is protection for, for customers when something goes wrong. That doesn't exist for instant payments. So 
that is not really like a competitive advantage. We should really create a regulatory framework that is harmonizing consumer rights across different payment solutions. That would be a first element. If that, when that is being done, then of course there can be some of the advantages that are being offered by some credit card companies, like collecting points or insurance uh, for some for travel or so. Mm -hmm. But you have to put that really in an overall comp comparison. And if you compare the, the fee that you pay for your credit card every year, plus uh, maybe additional cost, with the price of instant payment, maybe it would be really worth for consumers to get away from the credit card and to uh, to really use the, the instant mm -hmm. payment system. But that needs to be done in a in a context where, uh, as, as a consumer, you are protected in the same way. Uh, and that is, a, for, the, for the moment, not yet the case. And that might be something that we should be to, uh, put on the to-do list also. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Monique. Uh, would anybody else like to remark on that uh, particular question? Okay, maybe not. Aline, do you want to go with the next question? Yeah. So I have another question here. So somebody saying, we heard uh, Commissioner McGuinness say that the Commission would take a legislative action on STC INST if required. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question to the Commission, but it's the question to the panel. So what timeline would you put on this? Uh, at what point in time in the future do you think a decision would be required on legislative action? So okay. it's a market question. Thank you. Javier, would you like to say something to this as from the EPC side and uh, running the SCT and scheme? Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I, uh, if, well, I would say uh, simply that uh, action should be taken once knowledge which is achieved. So we really know the intricacies and the nuances of the situation. So far, we are just, uh, in terms of what we are uh, analyzing SET INST vis-a-vis -vis the SEPA regulation, we are just uh, measuring the, the ratio that are mentioned in, in that regulation. So, but we are not really understanding the, the market dynamics. So first I would say we really uh, need to know what is happening so and that i know uh, it will take place so uh, in the very near future there will be some investigation taking place really trying to grasp um, why some psps are not adhering or what are the difficulties what are the costs uh, how large is uh, actually the uh, reachability in place which is probably much larger than uh, what can be uh, deduced from the figures of psps adhering because uh, uh, sites is not taken into account. So I think first we need to really know what is uh, happening and, and then afterwards uh, act, uh, but not, uh, not be too um, in a hurry uh, to react, uh, thinking that uh, regulation will solve uh, what maybe it's not solvable uh, through regulation. So first I, I'd say, I would say we really, uh, need to uh, understand the details and the intricacies of the market situation, and then uh, see if, if any regulation is needed. And, and, and probably even in that case, regulation should be uh, also very careful in addressing all the specific aspects. So it wouldn't be an easy uh, piece of regulation. Okay, thank you. Aline, you have more questions? Oh, yes, I have lots okay. of questions. Um, so maybe one here on, um, so what is the role do you think oh so what role do you see for fintechs and open banking slash psd2 uh, will play for the european payment solution so what is the role of fintechs and open banking for the european payment solution mm -hmm. in, uh, and here it goes on in this regard will request to pay scheme that is being introduced next month uh, be an alternative to the payment solution based on open epi or specified under the psd2 or will they be complementary mm -hmm. okay thank you aline i don't know joachim would you like to say something on this because of course yeah, you are there with a pan-european solution yeah well the the uh, on the epi initiative we invited fintechs to help us to build the new system so mm -hmm. it's uh, it's we now building the team of uh, of the company together and we want to share it between uh, people from the banks people from payment uh, industry and also from fintechs mm -hmm. and also including fintech companies to build the new system uh, because we we need a, we need to hurry up we have to have an agile 
working style uh, to get uh, real the, the fast track on this on this product. So there's a lot of room for fintechs, and we already get in contact with them how they can help us to build the system. The other one is that we the EPI is an open architecture. So we are including the, the PSPs. We are very yesterday we made some decisions about uh, the rules how PSPs can be on board from uh, in, in EPI start from the beginning. And also for fintechs, it's open that they can come to us and uh, including to the system because we want to have all the partners in Europe on board. So there's a role of them. But uh, what we always say, uh, it has to be the same rules for everybody who wants to contribute to the system has also to invest in the system. And, and somehow the banks have the feelings that some fintechs want to have a free ride, that they uh, only want to have uh, the, the free access to data, mm -hmm. to banks, to have their own business development, and the banks don't get the free access to their development. So we have to be very aware that there should be a level playing field for both uh, market participants. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, Aline? Maybe, yes. maybe a few nights, yeah. you will, or maybe one, one comment. I, I believe uh, we, we, in the current situation, we cannot afford not using the the skills and the good ideas that are coming, and, and including mm. from fintechs. Uh, and, and I believe the, the, the ERPB, so the European Retail Payment Board, understood that. And there, is, there are discussions, there is work being done there in order to be, I heard many times the word inclusive. I think we need to be inclusive, and that, that that's for me one of the the success factor in this undertaking. Indeed, yeah, absolutely. Okay, Aline. So me again. So mm. uh, so Dr. Smiles, there's a lot of interest here in the EPI. So we have another question potentially for you. Um, so you uh, EPI announced the proof of concept next year. What type of payment instrument will it be? Somebody's asking, is it card or QR code, or what will it be? Thank you. Yeah, well, we'll we will start with the the P2P instrument uh, because there's a lot of investment in the the bank already there, and we can link them all together. So we have a pan-European P2P instrument. This is uh, for sure that we will do. And then we work on the digital solution and also on the card payment. I, uh, it's already investigating which will be the next phase. Can we use part of the national schemes we have? Can we link them? Have we built new? Can we use the standards for them? And we have discussed this with the PSPs uh, because it's very necessary and for the third party acquirers because the third party acquirers are very necessary part of the solution. So there's a lot of discussion on the way, and the first one is P2P. Okay, thank you. Aline, I'm conscious also of the, the time. We were running this panel until 11 o'clock. You um, also wanted to uh, ask a question to the audience too on the digital euro. Uh, do you want to run that at the moment? Yes, we can run that on the side. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So everyone, if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a poll question coming up now, and it's open. Okay. Please vote. Thank you. Okay. So essentially asking whether a digital euro will support the rollout of digital payment solutions in Europe and uh, just to have uh, some thoughts on that. And maybe while we're waiting for that, uh, I would take the opportunity to uh, address a, a final question myself to uh, all our panelists there. Uh, so the digital euro, Fabia mentioned it as well, also Mairead McGuinness. Um, on the 12th of October, the ECB launched a public consultation on a digital euro. Um, how would you see a digital euro supporting the advancement of pan-European payments? Would somebody like to start on that? Monique? Yeah. I'm sure that the other panelists have much more to say than us, so I just give uh, my my two points here. Uh, from the consumer perspective, mm -hmm. we very much welcome uh, this uh, this idea. So to have a, a digital public currency, which is a public good next to, to the cash, we would just like to make two comments. And this is, of course, we are at the beginning of our reflection. But the two comments that we would like to make in this context is, first of all, this should not mean the end of physical cash. Mm -hmm. It is very important to keep. Physical cash for many reasons that I will not develop here because we don't have the time. But one very obvious reason is 
there must be physical cash as a backup solution when technology breaks down. We have all experienced uh, with the video calls that technology is not 100% reliable and that can be for short periods and for longer periods. And so cash must be still something that needs to be maintained. And the second point that I would like to make is we are concerned and maybe there are already explanations to that, but for the moment, our question is uh, how will uh, this digital currency be distributed? Because we understand that it will be distributed via traditional banks, mm. while traditional banks, for the moment, really try to move consumers away from ca uh, cash, mm. I mean, digital or not. Um, and so, um, will there be disproportionate fees for, digital for getting a, a access to digital currency or not? So, the distribution aspect and the role of intermediaries in having for consumers, access to digital currency is a very important point for us to be uh, to be addressed in order to really uh, find this an acceptable solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Monique. Uh, Gilles, you wanted to come in? Yes, uh, of course, uh, we've been reading uh, very carefully also the recent report that ECB has uh, issued regarding uh, what could be a digital euro and uh, what should be the rule. Uh, sorry, you, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah we do. Okay, and so I, I was saying that, uh, of course, uh, there is just one comment I would like to do. Uh, digital currencies, or CBDC in general, are at this stage still primarily a technical solution. Uh, a technical solution, which are still looking for the use case they want really to solve for the consumers, the merchants, and the wider payment ecosystem participants. So I believe uh, that we have not seen yet very well where could be the differentiating value proposition that would come with uh, digital currencies in the context of retail payment, at least. Uh, and from that standpoint, I think let's not be fooled by the enormous med media impact of the cryptocurrencies. These are not payment tools these days. These are primarily a speculative digital asset class that has been primarily used for this uh, purpose of uh, making speculation of, of, of particular nature. So we are not yet having bridged the gap between the crypto technology or blockchain based technology and actual wide use cases that would bring a differentiated value proposition. So I personally believe that Fabio was starting to allude very clearly to some use cases where the digital euro could bring something. This is for me the first direction we should explore. Where do we see with such technology something that we could not easily achieve or that would be much more expensive to achieve with other uh, technologies? Mm -hmm. The use case first, and then we know we can manage the technology. Okay, thank you. I may add. Uh, Please, Javier, go ahead. Thank you. Just to compliment, because I share very much the, the views expressed by Monique and by Gilles. Yes, we have to, to we have to uh, bear in mind the, the, the actual demand. We have to, to really respond to a market need. That is uh, crucial. And uh, I think that was mentioned by Mr. Panetta in his introductory words. Anything we do must serve citizens well. And I'm quoting uh, Mr. Panetta, serve citizens well. But I think, and this I am, I am also um, in sympathy with the with ECB, I, I think the ECB is not in, in, in the report and the and the public consultation, they are not or you are not announcing the issuing of a digital euro. Okay. It's you're announcing maybe an investigation mm -hmm. and that, that we need to uh, to to work on that, to bring the, the debate from the academic uh, stance to the laboratories and to the real world. And uh, the main message I think is that uh, coming from the report is that the only thing we cannot afford is not to be ready. So uh, time will tell us uh, when to issue and if issue a digital euro. But what we need to do and we need to start getting ready is to be in a position so that when the uh, need arises, when there is a demand, when there is a business case, then we can implement the, the solution and not wait until the demand is already there to start uh, thinking uh, for a solution. So I, and in that sense, I think the, the, this report comes in also very timely. We need to get ready. The only thing we cannot afford is not to be prepared. Exactly, you know, and I think this tallies very well with what uh, Fabio was saying earlier too. And uh, I think with what uh, Ulrich will say afterwards. Uh, Dimitri, do you want to add to this? Yes, yeah, if, you are, if you are, I wanted to, I mean, I, I, really, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm, 
I'm, co I'm conscious that, that uh, the G digital euro is quite hype as a, as a topic in itself. Mm. I just want, and it's just uh, flowing nicely, I believe, is what uh, uh, Javier was just mentioning. I, I will quote uh, another quote of uh, Fabio Panetta, and he said, um, we need to make sure that our currency is fit for the future and, and inaction is not an option. And, and the point is that today um, we are actually uh, providing euro in two forms, banknotes available to the general public and then the central bank deposits that is actually uh, with a limited access to banks. And, and we see, I mean, as, as was mentioned earlier, we see a decline in use of the banknotes. Mm -hmm. And it just belongs to a, a, a good management of the situation to, indeed, as, as Javier was mentioning, to stand ready to uh, uh, to, to uh, implement a digital euro if the if the need arises, basically. And just to to reassure Monique, maybe the point is not to replace uh, the banknotes. It's actually a complementary mean, except that it would be in a digital form that is complementing what we do with banknotes, basically. But, but I don't want to say too much about this because I, I, I run the risk of emptying what uh, Ulrich Binzal is, uh, uh, wants to say in a minute. Indeed. Thank you, Dimitri. Maybe I give the last word to Joachim on this topic. In the world of EPI, how do you feel about a possible digital euro and the role this can play to? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a question how it's implemented and mm -hmm. how it works. And I think I fully agree with Phil. We have to learn more about this. There are places where it's still now or already now a need for, for a digital euro, like in if you invested in, in blockchain ledger and security base, somehow you have to come to a euro to, to and there there would be a digital euro very helpful uh, on a wholesale basis. But if you really need a digital euro on the retail pay payment uh, side, it's still open, I think, mm -hmm. and this has to be investigated and has to try it and we have to use uh, look for use cases. But we have to be ready. So I think it's very good that we invest, that we look for it, that we search, that we make research, and we look for use cases. Okay, thank you. And I see that Aline has joined us in the meantime on screen. So uh, you have the results of the poll just to conclude this panel. Yes, we have. If I speak, here we go. So it is a clear yes. So will digital your support? The answer is clearly yes of the of the audience. Okay, thank you very much. So I will conclude myself by thanking uh, all the panelists for their great contributions to the discussion this morning, to Joachim, Monique, Javier, Gilles and uh, Dimitri. And uh, I hand over to you, Aline, for the next part.